Hey, thank you so much, Salim. It's so, such a pleasure to open the day with you. Um, so uh, I'd like to also to thank Ryan Leonard and team for inviting me to give this talk. And this talk is based on a work that came out of an inter interdisciplinary working group that we started at Harvard about eight years ago with Salim's support. And in particular, discussions and ongoing work with a wonderful group of researchers, and this is a good opportunity to acknowledge their work and thank them for their ideas and contributions. And before I begin, let me say that although I will mention some laws and attempt to interpret them, this is a story about research direction and should not be considered any form of legal advice. So uh, we're all aware that computer systems are making many decisions of far-reaching consequences. Maybe a first example that has been with us for many years is credit score. My credit score provides an assessment of the potential risk that I pose as a consumer. It's calculated based on information collected by credit bureaus, and it is used in a variety of financial decisions by lenders, banks, and even when I rent an apartment. As a second example uh, that has received a lot of attention in the last few years, judges, probation officers, and parole officers are increasingly using algorithms in support of their decision making. For instance, Compass is a proprietary machine learning tool that is used by the US courts, and Compass provides judges with an assessment of a criminal defendant's likelihood of uh, becoming a recidivist prediction of whether a defendant would fail to show up in court and much more. And also algorithms also provide us with, uh, each of us with a different personalized access to the world. And these algorithms have influence on which opportunities we get and what we learn about the world. And examples include targeted behavioral advertising and personalized recommendations. And these are only just a few examples where algorithms are used in making important decisions or assisting important decisions. And these examples also raise grave concerns about loss of privacy, discrimination, fairness, manipulation, and more. So these were some higher level examples of decisions made in computer systems. But all these systems are, uh, are composed of smaller and less glamorous components where decisions are made about more mundane but very important actions. Like algorithms are making decisions regarding the collection, storage, deletion, processing, and sharing of personal information. It's hard for me to estimate how many such decisions are made daily, but I'm sure the numbers are huge and growing fast. And these decisions are at, la at large opaque to users. They're opaque to experts and to policymakers, and sometimes opaque even to those who design and operate the systems. And that is in spite of these operations being regulated, at least to some extent, by our legal privacy and data protection standards, in particular, the more modern ones like the EU General Data Protection Regulation and the California Consumer Protection Act, uh, Act and the California Privacy Rights Act. So on the positive side, it's really an improvement over the more traditional regulations that these regulations, the new ones, address uh, issues uh, like storage and collection of data. But can we actually tell whether they are, these regulations are enforced in a meaningful way? The opacity of uh, our system doesn't help and researchers have hard time identifying problems and measuring them with precise scientific tools. Moreover, with a huge number of decisions being made, we must make sure that all or almost all of these decisions are done right as even only a small fraction of these decisions requiring deliberation would exceed the pace that the human judiciary or administrative system would be able to delegate. So here's the question. Can we make sure that decisions which are made in computer systems agree with our legal requirements? Now, if you ask me this question when I was a bit younger, I would probably try to say that this is none of our business. 
Uh, we've been doing all we could do, I would claim, by developing strong notions of security, such as semantic security, zero knowledge, security multi-party computation, differential privacy, and a lot of other stuff. And besides the law being what it is, wordy and somewhat intentionally vague, makes it impossible to reason about the law with mathematical rigor as we do in cryptography and theoretical computer science. So what's the point? But a more up-to-date version of me would say something different. I may begin with a cheesy statement such as a chain of rigorous reasoning is only as strong as its least rigorous link and maybe even provide you with a picture. And then I will argue that the entire purpose of developing strong technologies such as secure multi-party computation and differential privacy was to make sure we can construct systems that achieve societal goals. So what's the benefit of rigorous treatment of privacy and data protection if we don't try at least uh, to carry this uh, rigorous analysis to the end? So this is the claim I'll try to make in this talk. It's encouraging that more and more computer scientists believe that it is our responsibility to establish paradigms to make sure that our algorithms achieve societal goals. And in the last two decades, we've seen an incredible progress in formalizing and analyzing privacy and fairness, as well as the emergence of new conferences devoted to responsible computing. So in this vein, and I'm gonna focus here mainly on privacy and data protection with the goal of establishing paradigms for computer science and law to co-evolve, and in particular paradigms for translating between these two very different disciplines. So I would like to claim that this can be done at a high level of rigor, at least in some cases. That is, it is possible to establish a high standard of technical legal arguments, which I will refer to as legal theorems. And moreover, I would like to demonstrate that theoretical computer science has already developed tools which are extremely relevant for this kind of analysis. Uh, there are many challenges towards establishing a fruitful interaction of computer science and law. Theoretical computer science has successfully bridged to other areas of scientific study. Economics is a noticeable example but the success hinged to a large extent on being able to build on well-defined mathematical concepts. And we don't have that with the law. Now, privacy is naturally inherently a concept which has a dual nature. I will call that a hybrid concept. On one hand, privacy is a normative concept grounded in philosophy, social science, and the law. And on the other hand, it is a technical concept, and more so as we talk about privacy in the digital age. So focusing on the technical and legal aspects of privacy, we see very different approaches. So on the computer science side, we see concepts such as encryption, zero knowledge, secure multi-party computation, differential privacy, and others. We have definitional paradigms that we have perfected over decades of research. And our definitions use precise mathematical formulation. And we use rigorous mathematical reasoning. On the legal side, we see something very different. We see a large collection of concepts which serve as the basic building blocks of legal privacy standards. These concepts include the notion of personally identifiable information, or PII, as well as many other concepts. I will just enumerate a few, uh, the identification, anonymization, linkability, and quite a few more. These concepts are not defined with mathematical precision. There are many gray areas left, making it hard, or maybe very hard, to confidently determine whether a privacy goal is preserved, and at the same time, leaving many loopholes to be exploited. And moreover, legal desiderata lags behind our scientific understanding to the point they sometimes express goals which are simply not achievable. A notable example is ignoring uh, the cumulative effect of multiple data releases on privacy. 
So I want to mention some work, some related work, and I apologize that this is not a co comprehensive list, and I will focus on work in directions which are most relevant to, uh, to this talk. So maybe the first is contextual integrity. This is a framework that was put forward by the philosopher Helen Nissenbaum, and I find it relevant to the discussion today because Nissenbaum combines the normative and the technical. So contextual integrity is a framework for reasoning about privacy as norms applied to information flows between contexts. The framework is not defined with mathematical precision, so it is hard to integrate its reasoning into a rigorous mathematical discussion of computer systems. But nevertheless, there were a few attempts, including the one that is mentioned on this slide, to formulate aspects of contextual integrity uh, using logic. Second uh, project uh, that I want to mention was uh, done at Harvard and planning to use differentially private analysis in the privacy tools project. We ask ourselves whether we could support the, the legality of doing so when the data is uh, in question contained educational records. So in the working group that I already mentioned, we examined the FERPA educational rights the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act, in short FERPA, which governs the disclosure of personal information contained in educational records. We extracted a mathematical definition of privacy for FERPA. It was a conservative definition in the sense that our definition seems stricter, maybe much stricter than the FERPA requirements. So hence, uh, satisfying our definition suffices for satisfying FERPA's requirements that may not be necessary. Using this de mathematical definition, we prove that uh, it is satisfied by differential privacy and hence concluded that the use of differential privacy is suitable for uh, the FERPA requirements. As another example, uh, Cohen and Park and later Scheffler and Varia focus on the question of compelled decryption. This is an important issue of self incrimination in the digital age. Uh, while the Fifth Amendment of the US Constitution states that no person shall be compelled to witness against himself, the government may still compel individuals to decrypt their information when doing so is considered a foregone conclusion. That means it, it adds little or nothing to the sum total of the government's information. And the work by Scheffler and Varia applied the real versus ideal paradigm developed in cryptography uh, to model foregone conclusion. Another work uh, that utilized the real versus ideal definition of framework is by Doug Goldwasser and, and Vasu Devan, where they used the framework to formalize the right to be forgotten and uh, deletion. This work helps clarify what their deletion laws may expect from technical solutions. Unfortunately, the current laws, uh, especially uh, this is discussed in Europe, are rather vague to allow us to judge whether the technical definitions match the regulator's intent. And the last one I want to mention is the work that I'll speak about in more detail in a few minutes. Uh, this is on modeling a notion called singling out. So for the rest of this talk, I would like to show one example uh, singling out in, in more detail. I'll begin with a brief background. Then we will look into legal concepts, in, into the, this legal concept of singling out and uh, model it. We then will show benefits of the modeling and we'll end with a short summary and an epilogue. Okay, so as background, I will present very briefly three concepts, uh, canonymity, differential privacy, and composition. And let me just be clear that even though these are interesting concepts that deserve discussion by themselves, they are not the focus of my, of my talk today. And I'm just using them for demonstrating a paradigm which we pursued towards bridging between technical and legal conceptions of privacy. 
let me begin with anonymity. So a K anonymized data set is a data set where potentially identifying information is suppressed so as to make each row in the data set appear K times. So here's a toy example. In this slide, you see a data set before suppression on the left and also a two anonymized version of the same data set. You can see that some of the data has been uh, suppressed. These are the asterisks that we see here. As, uh, as an example, you cannot tell which rows began to the person be, uh, belongs to the person that you know from zip code 23456 because they are uh, identical in terms of the uh, in terms of the identifying information. And in particular, you may not be able to tell whether that person had a heart disease or a viral disease. Okay, anonymity is a popular technique. There are many papers about it and many algorithms suggested. The idea is easy to understand uh, and it follows a certain type of re-identification attacks uh, called linkage attacks. And many regulations seems to be open to anonymity, including HIPAA in the US, as they equate privacy and anonymity. However, it's been shown that anonymity is vulnerable to a variety of simple attacks. And, and in response to these attacks, uh, researchers presented variants such as L-diversity and T-closeness. But for the purpose of today's talk, uh, the differences between these variants are not uh, important. Differential privacy captures uh, the following intuition. So I assume that my information is included in some analysis. I feel at risk because some information about me may be leaked by the analysis into its outcome. Ideally, I would like the analysis to be performed with my data omitted. And this way, there would be no risk that the analysis may leak some information that is sensitive and specific to me in its outcome. But in the real world, it's different. My information is included. So differential privacy is a property of the analysis. An analysis is differentially private if its outcome is stable in the following sense. For every individual, uh, in, in this case, it's, it's me, but every individual, the outcome uh, distribution remains almost the same, whether that individual's information is included or is not included in the analysis. So this definition does not require the outcome distributions to be identical. It turns out that this would mean that the analysis must ignore all its input and become useless. So instead, there is a parameter here, epsilon, and the definition allows some non-negligible distance between the distributions, between the outcome distributions. And epsilon bounds privacy loss. It's referred to as the privacy loss parameter and um, plays an important role in, in budgeting and, and managing privacy in differential privacy. I'm not going to get into a lot of details, um, so the intuition that was pictured in the previous slide is formalized in this mathematical definition. Um, several variants of differential privacy exist and presenting here the simplest one, which is also referred to as pure differential privacy. Now, having a well-formulated mathematical definition uh, for differential privacy allows us to make formal claims uh, we can examine concrete mechanisms and, and, and actually prove that they satisf satisfy differential privacy. Um, uh, and this mechanism can uh, do uh, quite a lot of tasks. They can uh, compute statistics, they can perform machine learning tasks, uh, they can generate synthetic data, they can do other stuff. However, being a mathematical concept and somewhat hard to explain, 
presents barriers to acceptance of the concept in communities outside the theoretical computer science. And this is part of the bridging work we are trying to do uh, in the, the differential privacy community to uh, make the concept more accessible outside theoretical computer science. And the third concept I want to mention is composition. So assume we have a collection of L mechanisms here on the left. Each of them, let's say, is K anonymous. What happens if we consider a bigger mechanism, which is just the combination of this mechanism? This bigger mechanism applies each of the mechanisms on its data and spits out their outputs. Is this mechanism also K anonymous? This is a composition question. It turns out that this not, doesn't have to be the case. And uh, an early work by Ganta et al. showed theoretically in also simulations that K anonymity does not, is not preserved under composition. And there's a recent work of Aloni Cohen that shows that this also happens with real world K anonymized datasets. You can ask the same question about differential privacy. And it turns out that differential privacy does compose and the resulting privacy loss parameter can be computed or at least bounded. And we have a collection of composition theorems for doing that. So that was my brief um, uh, background. And the rest of the talk is mostly based on these two papers. Together, they provide a legal technical analysis uh, of, of this concept called singling out from the GDPR. And I will try now to show some of this analysis. So we'll now begin with some readings in the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation is a European privacy law that went into effect three years ago in May 2018. And the, this legal standard governs the use of any personal information in the European Union. And data can be accepted from the regulation if it is processed and so as to be rendered anonymous, okay? And we will see to understand what it means for data to be rendered anonymous, we would need to understand a specific concept from the GDPR, which is called singling out. We'll make an attempt to develop a technical concept matching the GDPR notion of singling out. What we will get is a different concept that we will call predicate singling out. Okay, so let's begin our reading in the GDPR. Article one of the GDPR sets the scope of the regulation. The article says, this regulation lays down rules relating to the protection of natural persons with regard to the processing of personal data. That is, if you process personal data, which is about natural persons, then the GDPR applies. I'm not going to focus on the question of what consists natural persons. It's an important one, but not my focus. But rather, I'll focus on the question of what personal data means. And when we get a little more detail in Article 4 of this legal standard, it says, Personal data means any information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person directly or indirectly. So to understand what consists or does not consist personal data, we need to understand what it means that information can be related to an identifiable natural person. And we have further uh, clarification in recital 26 of the GDPR. It says, to determine whether a natural person is identifiable, account should be taken of all the means reasonably likely to be used, such as singling out, to identify the natural person directly or indirectly. So here's the place where we meet this concept of singling out. 
So it's worth noting that a similar recital existed in the regulation that preceded the GDPR, the Data Protection Directive of 1995. And the main change between the two recitals in the GDPR and the Data Protection Directive is the explicit mentioning of signaling out as a means reasonably likely to be used. And let me also say that no other means are mentioned explicitly in the law itself. So maybe this indicates that the GDPR regulators saw specific importance in protection against singling out. So what we learn is if it is possible to single out in the data, then the data is identifiable and hence the GDPR applies. Or in other words, to be accepted from the GDPR, data needs to be anonymized. And to be considered anonymized, singling out should be prevented as long as other means likely to be used to identify persons in the data. Now, the GDPR itself does not give us all we need. And to further understand what singling out means, we refer to guidance documents. Now, these are guidance documents that were prepared by a working party, which was set by the Data Protection Directive, the one that preceded the GDPR. The working party produced opinions, recommendations, uh, reports, providing expert opinion, guidelines, and generally it provided the interpretation of the Data Protection Directive requirements. And they did put forward three criteria for rendering data anonymous. Is it, sing is it is singling out a risk? Is linkability a risk? And is inference a risk? Now, the Article 29 Working Party has been replaced by the European Data Protection Board, EDPB, but the EDPB has not yet provided updated guidance on the questions that we will discuss today, except repeating the focus on singling out linkability and inference. So uh, the Article 29 Working Party documents are hence are, are, are still those providing the most authoritative interpretation of the concepts that we will discuss. So let's read what they say. As regards indirectly identified or identifiable persons, this category typically relates to the phenomenon of unique combinations, whether small or large in size. A name may itself not be necessary in all cases to identify an individual. This may happen when other identifiers are used to single someone out. So we learned that singling out does not require an explicit identification, a name, and signaling out can happen via a unique combination of attributes. And this combination could be simple or complex, small or large. And furthermore, uh, the Article 29 Working Party has examined a host of technologies, as you see in this table, uh, with respect to the three anonymization criteria, singling out, linkability, and inference. We'll focus on the left column. And in particular, the conclusion that anonymity and similarly L diversity, as I said for the, today's talk, uh, the differences between the two are immaterial. They concluded that these eliminate the risk of singling out. And also they had some unclear conclusion with respect to differential privacy. They ask, is singling out still a risk? And with respect to anonymity and L diversity, they say no. With respect to differential privacy, they say may not. So I, now I want to begin with our analysis. And to present the analysis, I would like first to present a simple model. So we will assume that the data set X is sampled IID for some underlying distribution D. The data set is the input to an anonymization mechanism M. And the anonymization mechanism M may perform any computation on the data. 
it could try to make it anonymized, or maybe it would compute a statistic, or maybe it uh, will uh, create sanitized data set. Now, the output of the anonymization mechanism is give, given as input to a singling out adversary. And the singling out adversary outputs a description of a potential person in the data set X. So uh, mathematically, we'll model this as outputting a predicate over the attributes stored in the data set X. So we'll first examine an idea which seems to fit the Article 29 working party interpretation, which, and we are going to call this isolation. So if singling out is identical to, to isolation, that the goal of the singling out adversary is to output a predicate which matches exactly one row in the data set X. So this is our first definitional attempt. The mechanism M, we say that M is secure against singling out if no adversary can isolate a row in, in X except with neg negligible probability. And the probability is over all the randomness here is the uh, randomness in choosing X IAD from D and the coins of M and A. So this seems natural and also seems to fit the Article 29 working party interpretation, but uh, this definition turns to be a notion which is generally impossible to achieve. Let's see why. So consider what happens when the singling out adversary does not get to see the outcome of the anonymization mechanism, okay? I'm going to call such an adversary a trivial adversary. Assume further that the data set contains 356 random, uh, actually 365 random birth dates, and let the adversary choose an arbitrary date, okay? Uh, without looking, without getting any information about the data. Uh, we get that this predicate uh, Q matches a fraction one over 365 of the universe. A simple calculation then shows that the adversary succeeds to isolate about 37% of the time. And this is definitely not a negligible probability. And this actually generalizes. So assume that the data is sampled from a distribution with moderate mean entropy, at least logarithmic in, in N. Then the adversary can apply the leftover hash lemma to output a predicate of weight approximately one in N. And redoing the calculation gives uh, that the adversary success in isolating is about one over E. Actually, it's always greater than one over E. And that is about 37%. So what does this trial uh, of defining singling out as isolation teach us? So assume that instead of choosing a predicate of weight one over N, the adversary chooses a predicate of weight W. So repeating the same simple calculation, we get the following expression, which we take as a baseline for comparison. And if you look at the baseline, it is maximized when the weight W is one over N, and it goes to zero as we deviate from one over N, either we increase or decrease uh, the, the weight. In particular, when the weight W is negligible, the baseline is also negligible. So our modified definition will use the following idea. Singling out happens when the adversary improves significantly over the baseline, meaning that the adversary uh, uh, improves over a trivial adversary uh, outputting a, a, a predicate of, of the same weight or, 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 or similar weight. So let's see uh, uh, examples when uh, the adversary manages to do something that 
may be considered significant. Like if we're using a predicate of one over n, as in the birth date example, the attacker succeeds with probability 37%, okay? We're not impressed uh, if uh, the attacker succeeds with 37% uh, uh, chance of, of, uh, of, of uh, isolation, because we could do that even without access to the data. But if the attacker succeeds with probability close to 100%, then the attacker actually makes use of the anonymizing mechanism. And this may be considered as a singling out, as a successful singling out. And even more so, if an attacker manages to isolate with a predicate that is of such low weight such that we don't even expect that a person satisfying the description exists, then this is not trivial. So I'm going to give here just a simplified and informal version of the definition. First, no, the, note that we don't call our concept singling out, but predicate singling out to distinguish them. Uh, we want to indicate that this technical concept differs from the GDPR concept of the singling out. And furthermore, if you also want to go through a modeling exercise and try to come up with another uh, model for uh, uh, the GDPR notion of singling out, there, there is a room uh, for, that, for that concept uh, and we can name them differently and we can compare them. So we hope that uh, this is just the starting point for, for this kind of uh, discussion. Now, to simplify things, I only refer to singling out with a predicate of negligible weight. We say that M, the anonymizing mechanism, is secure against predicate singling out if no adversary can isolate with a predicate of negligible weight, except with a negligible uh, probability. That is, considering negligible weight predicates, the adversary cannot improve significantly over the baseline, which is also negligible. So now we can ask quite a few questions. For instance, is security against predicates singling out attainable? Okay, otherwise, if it's a vacuous, vacuous concept, then it's not very interesting. Uh, does this notion compose? And whether differential privacy and anonymity provide security against predicate singling out? And you could ask other questions also. So the first result is count, that counting mechanism, such as reporting the number of persons in the data set who are, the, who are diabetic, these mechanisms are secure against predicate singling out. This is an important family of uh, mechanisms. It allows us to perform statistics, at least basic statistics over the data while satisfying this uh, criteria. We can also ask whether this notion uh, composes. And here we have a negative result. Uh, Predicate singling out security against uh, predicate singling out does not self compose. Now we have two proofs for this negative result. In the first proof, uh, we use little omega of log n mechanisms, counting mechanisms, and and because these are simple and natural mechanisms that are likely to be used in many applications, uh, we think this is significant. And furthermore, we uh, believe that because these are simple and, 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 and very useful mechanisms that uh, this failure to compose may indicate a problem, not only with our formulation, but also with the concept of singling out more broadly. Second proof, is, is stronger, it only uses two mechanisms. So it demonstrates that even two uh, PSO secure mechanisms, uh, each of them secure individually, when we combine them, we lose the security. But uh, the mechanisms we use here seem less likely to be similar to mechanisms that would be used in practice. So now we're ready to make determinations 
whether the two technologies that I focused on, differential privacy and anonymity, provide security against predicate signaling out. So for differential privacy, we can prove that any mechanism which satisfies differential privacy is also secure against predicate signaling out. And the proof reveals some uh, connections between singling out and the generalization properties of differential privacy is a subject that has received much attention in the last five, six years. Now for canonymity, we prove that typically canonymity enables predicate singling out. In particular, when the underlying distribution has sufficient mean entropy. Furthermore, the proof demonstrates uh, how the K anonymizer actually assists the attacker, that the outcome of the K anonymizer provides the attacker with a predicate that needs to be slightly modified by application of the leftover hash lemma so as to successfully predicate single out. Let me give a uh, like sketch quickly how this proof goes. So consider data which went through canonymization as in the slide. And we make a couple of observations. First, we can look at the outcome of the K anonymizer. So this is the colorful uh, uh, data set here. We can look at it as a collection of predicates, each corresponding to Sorry about this. Okay. As a collection of predicates, each corresponding to the attributes which were not suppressed in the group uh, of K rows, in a group of K rows. So here, here we see the predicates. Uh, now, canonymization aims to suppress as little as possible. So the weight of each of these predicates would typically be negligible. And these predicates uh, do not isolate in the data, but they are, get us quite close to isolation. They get us to groups of size K or maybe a little more. So very little is needed now to be done to turn one of these predicates provided by the K anonymizer into a predicate that isolates in the data. So we can now apply the leftover hash lemma as we did with the trivial uh, uh, adversary before. So this way it's easy to create a predicate over the remaining attributes uh, in the data set with the weight about one over K, the attributes that were not suppressed. And this predicate isolates with probability 37%. So the attacker can now output a predicate of negligible weight that isolates with probability 37%, uh, meaning that the attacker can now uh, 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 predicate single out. Now notice that the theorems that I just mentioned talk about compliance, not with a legal standard, but a concept that we have just invented, predicate signaling out. Okay, so we still need to ask whether uh, what this says about uh, the requirements of the GDPR. So how do we cross this last, last bridge? So let's recall some of our modeling decision and design, design choices for security against predicates in being out. So first we only considered IID data. This is in a sense the simplest case to deal with. So we should expect any anonymizer to deal well with IID data, but real world data will typically include dependencies. Second, in our modeling, the attacker only gets to see the outcome of the anonymizing mechanism, and in particular does not get access to any auxiliary information. And finally, in our analysis, we focus on predicates of negligible weight, but predicates of non-negligible weight may still be of interest. So this means that our modeling is of a concept which is likely weaker 
than what the GDPR regulators had in mind for singling out. So in terms of consequences that we can draw, this means that negative results are of a higher consequence. Failure to protect against predicate singling out likely implies failure to protect, to protect against GDPR singling out. So now we're ready to cross a line between computer science and law and make what I will call a legal theory. So let's first look at, on the legal side. We go, recall that recital 26 tells us that if a mechanism enables singling out attacks, the legal notion of singling out, maybe not the one that we uh, uh, introduced, that this mechanism fails to anonymize under the requirements of the GDPR. On the computer science side, on the technical side, we've put forward a notion that we called predicate singling out, and we proved that anonymity typically enables predicate singling out. Furthermore, as we just discussed, we made modeling decisions which make predicate singling out potentially weaker than the legal notion of singling out. So if anonymity enables predicate singling out, then it also enables the GDPR notion of singling out and hence fails to anonymize under the GDPR. And now that our positive result with respect to differential privacy has only restricted implications. So for differential privacy, we show that it prevents predicate singling out. This suggests that it may be more suitable than anonymity for the GDPR anonymization standard, but we need to do more analysis for two reasons. The first is that predicate singling out is likely weaker than the GDPR notion. And the second reason is that singling out is only one of the means likely to be used to identify a natural person. So the protection of differential privacy needs also to be assessed with respect to other means. As a concrete consequence of this work, we believe that the Article 29 Working Party Assessment of Anonymity, similarly L diversity, should be reconsidered. And we hope that the EDPB, the European Data Protection Board, which replaced the Article 29 Working Party under the GDPR, will update its recommendations in consideration of our analysis. So let me summarize what we've seen. So we began with a concept appearing in legal data protection, in a legal data protection standard, the GDPR, and trying to model it, we came up with a definition of security against predicate singling out. This is a technical concept that probably does not fully capture the concept of singling out from the legal documents and legal guidance. But having a precise technical concept, we found that it's not vacuous. So there's a significant family of mechanisms, counting mechanisms that is secure against predicate singling out. And furthermore, we show that the concept does not self-compose. And we, we, we noted that this may have consequences not only for the concept we presented, but the, to the GDPR notion of singling out. We improved the claim which I believe has legal consequences. Canonymization enables predicate single out and hence taking our design decisions into account, it's likely that it's not sufficient for satisfying the GDPR standard of anonymization. We also proved that differential privacy prevents predicate singling out. This provides some but insufficient evidence that the use of differential privacy satisfies the GDPR anonymization standards. Finally, this is something I did not have time to show today, but uh, you can find it in the paper. We suggest model language for defining single, uh, singling out in, in regulation and contracts, which takes into account lessons that we have learned in this legal technical analysis. Let me clarify that we still do not know whether the European Data Protection Board and similarly European courts would adapt to the consequences of this analysis. But I do hope that the analysis that we saw uh, demonstrates the two points that I want to make. One, that it's possible, at least in some cases, to apply a high level of rigor, 
Technical rigor and legal rigor were when considering the interaction between technology and law. And the second one is that theoretical computer science has developed paradigms and tools which are very relevant for this kind of analysis. Two more slides before I finish. First, I began the talk arguing that a large number of decisions of legal consequence are being made in computer systems and it's essential that we would develop new paradigms for ensuring that decisions taken in computer systems satisfy legal requirements. More broadly, it's for societal desiderata. In particular, we need to ensure that adequate protection is provided to individuals, to groups, and society at large. This is an opportunity for collaboration between computer scientists and legal scholars towards co-evolving or co-designing aspects of this interaction between the very different areas of study. And this kind of collaboration, as we see, would require rethinking of some of our definitional paradigms and reasonings, and it will likely highlight fresh new algorithmic challenges. And hopefully it will help us develop better data protection technology and future regulation. Let me mention just one possible research direction that I find fascinating. So meaningful computer science law interaction requires definitions of basic concepts. And considering the uh, dual legal technical nature of privacy, we need to develop concepts that provide consistent legal and technical interpretations that can be embedded in legal as well as technical arguments. I call such concepts hybrid concepts. We're far from there. But can we develop privacy concepts that respect this hybrid legal technical nature? If we manage to do that, if we succeed, then this can become the basic building blocks of a meaningful interaction between technology and law. So let me just conclude here. Uh, I'll show you uh, the summary slide. And thank you for listening. I'm happy to discuss or take questions now.